Hello, welcome to the ongoing series on how to set up SQL Monitor after you've made your purchase and after you've gotten your install. Now at this point, what we're working on is alerts and alerting. And there are two approaches you could take to this. One is very messy, but easier, and one is probably the better approach. The messy and easy approach would be to turn on SQL Monitor, set it up, and let it start running and let it tell you what alerts you're getting and then you, and then you start making adjustments. I don't like this one just because it's going to leave a bad taste in people's mouths if we don't immediately eliminate things that we think should be eliminated before we see them or turn on things that we think should be turned on before you know we miss them. And that's the key to me, is that the alerting needs to be actionable and useful to you. So here's my approach that I would normally take. What I would suggest you do is go straight to the configurations and to the alert settings that you have today, and then walk through these and identify which ones you think might not be that important. And if you have the least doubt well, I'm not sure what this is, leave it in place. That's a safe approach, and then you can figure out which ones that you do and don't need. So for example, we might scroll through here and determine that maybe long-running query is something that we don't need in our systems. And so maybe disabling the long-running query alert would be something that we would want to do here. And we could just simply disable it. Um, and we can customize things. Also, it's a good idea to let people know exactly why you're disabling it. Um, we're monitoring primarily data warehouse systems. There are a lot of long-running queries. This is more likely to generate more noise than anything actionable or useful. And so it's something like this, walking through and understanding what's going on inside here and then making that determination as to which ones should be turned on and which ones should be turned off. That would be step one for me. And that also means that you need to look and see, like, are there anything that's turned off by default? Because we have a lot of alerts. Maybe there's something you want to turn on. For example, you might find that, hey, I would like to know if any jobs have been canceled. There's no reason we should be having canceled jobs in our systems. Therefore, I'm going to come in here. I'm going to turn on the, the alert. I'm going to set it, oh, initially we'll set it to low because that's just informational. And we're then going to have, um, no, don't email this alert. We'll just have it in the system and, and it'll be there. We can track things through it. Um, we're not going to send SNMP and we're not going to send anything to Slack but we're going to then apply the changes. I can't do it from here just because this is a uh, um, the monitor.regate.com site so you guys can see the defaults as they're set up. But that's what I would do is, is identify the alerts I want to turn on and the alerts I want to turn off based on the alerts that are here. That's step one. Step two, once I've determined I've got a set of alerts I like, they're on, they're off, they're on, the next step would be to go in and make a determination as to whether or not the alert level is correct. For example, in my case, I don't expect to see a lot of deadlock alerts. Now, if you'll notice over here, we've got over 11,000 of them. So this system is clearly getting hammered with deadlocks. Normally, that would be a very high concern for me. I would want to focus down on that and address it immediately. But I do know that organizations make the determination that oh, living with deadlocks is just part of the cost of doing business. I may or may not agree. But let's say that I'm actually managing the systems myself. And I'm happy with the idea that deadlocks is something that should be a high-level alert. If I see a deadlock on my system, it should be a rare event. And it's something that requires me to take action immediately. So I'm going to set the alert level to high. I'm going to make sure that it sends an email um, either to the default email address or to an alternate email address, however I want to do it. 
but it is an actionable event that I am going to modify this and apply the changes so that I ensure that when deadlocks occur, I know about it. That's something that we should do. Conversely, we may go in and say like, well, let's see, whether or not the processor is running high, I don't necessarily care about that. What's this do? It raises a medium alert if the processor is more than 90%. Well, maybe we need to tune that down. Let's say that it's a low-level alert if the processor is more than 90%. We can make modifications to these and pick and choose what we think. And we can also add multiple thresholds. And here is the idea of making multiple thresholds. So if it goes over 95, we get a high-level alert. If it's over 85, we get a low-level alert. And we can set a threshold time. I would strongly recommend that you walk through and make an initial set of choices on the general behavior of alerting. Now, the initial set of choices of, you, of just using the defaults for most people in most situations will be fine, but I would suggest that you just validate that. I wouldn't turn on everything. I would not turn off everything. I would just go through here and make that first judgment call and that first pass to ensure that you're seeing more signal and less noise, that the information you're receiving through your alert systems are actionable so that you're actually doing things with them as opposed to simply collecting the information or, or even worse, shunting it off into a folder that you then delete later and never look at. That is the worst thing that can happen. Now, after that, there's another step to tuning alerts, and that is an ongoing step. And we'll talk about that in the next video. My name is Grant Fritchie. I work for Redgate Software. Thank you for watching.